What's up, gangsters? How about episode 13 of this little Tamiya 148 Spitfire Mark I build adventure? With this one, uh, it's going to end up mostly being about one topic, which is masking the canopies. Not an insignificant thing with uh, model airplanes, so I feel okay about that. But this one is, is uh, filled up with that, mostly because I wanted to go through the process with you guys of using a silhouette uh, portrait to uh, cutter to uh, do the masks. Uh, as you know, with Tamiya, they don't cut them for you. They give them to you on a nicely printed little sheet of, uh, of masking material, but they don't cut them out. And I didn't feel like going and spending the 10 or 12 bucks on a masking set from Edward, so I just thought, well, you know what? I've got the cutter. I've got a scanner. Let's try it. So let's get right into it. Okay, so back at it with the little Spitfire, and in preparation for uh, getting ready to finish the priming on this, I've been doing a couple of small tasks. One is uh, I went ahead and added the gun sight there, because obviously it's going to need that before the windscreen goes in, and this is just one of the things I love about Tamiya. Not only does that thing just drop right in there the way that you want it to for a clear part like that, but they give you really good paint relief lines on there so that you can make it look good. I uh, attempted to take care of that uh, little bit of crookedness in that spar right there and didn't have a lot of success. But you can kind of see uh, maybe why it's a little bit crooked because it is pretty centered in the individual parts. But if you look at that former there that the headrest is on, see how it's flush against the side of the fuselage on the right? And there's a little bit of a gap there on the uh, on the left side by my thumbnail there. Um, you can see that there. Anyway, obviously there's a little bit of uh, crookedness in the in the way that those that I've assembled those formers. Just a little bit of slop, and you know these things happen. It's not too noticeable. Now something that I did want to check. Okay, I talked in the in the last episode about the misalignment there that you can see in evidence on either side of that teardrop shape cutout uh, for the uh, aerial. And so I wanted to put that in there and take a look at it because if the fit was not going to be right, uh, right now was the time to figure that out. So I got that off the sprue and I poked it in there and it does go in, uh, fits, fits fine, but I want to zoom in here and, and show you something, okay? Because I asked on Scale Modeler's critique group if anybody else had seen the misalignment between the left and the right halves. And uh, one guy posted a very close-up photo of that exact spot and he was like, nope, I hadn't seen it. Okay, but his photo, even though it was a little bit dark and hard to see, showed that slightly larger gap on the right-hand side at the back of that teardrop shape. Uh, it's a little bit tough to see on camera, but it's unmistakable when you're looking at it through an optivisor. You just kind of have to get it at the at the exact right angle, but you can see it there. Uh, so point being is, some of these things are just so small and difficult to notice that a lot of guys just simply aren't going to see them. But I'm certainly not the only one who is who has uh, the issue of that slight misalignment on the uh, left and right halves of the of the fuselage. Anyway, not, not, not a terribly big deal. If it's still there when I go to install this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it then. Uh, it still will be there. Uh, I shouldn't say if, but I'll deal with it then. Uh, I have some ideas about how to do that because I, I don't like that. Now, the other thing you'll notice is that there is a hole that I've drilled there. Uh, and that in the process of drilling said hole, uh, that the fuselage joint opened up and I have a little bit of a crack there. That's a bummer, um, but uh, not a huge big deal. I'll just uh, flow some uh, extra thin 
uh, back in there and uh, that'll, that'll take care of, of the uh, of the of the strength issue and hopefully my next layer of primer will uh, will cover that uh, shouldn't be too big of a deal at any rate the reason that that hole is there is because there's a light that goes uh, uh, right there maybe uh, and the reason I say maybe is because I honestly am not even sure that that little light is on all Spitfires and you know anybody who says anything about all Spitfires is looking to lose a bet because they were all over the map but you can see right there part D6 okay that's clear part plugs into that hole but the thing is okay uh, where is the hole? All right, I don't remember it being there. I certainly don't think I would have accidentally filled a hole of that size. Uh, it's a one, come on, focus up. It's a 1.2 millimeter diameter hole, which you find when you come over here and measure the uh, nub that's sticking out on the back side of part D6, that teardrop shaped thing there. Uh, that's a 1.2 millimeter stub. So I, I was like, what, did I miss something in the instructions? Well, okay. So look here, I don't see a hole. Right there should be about where that arrow from B18 lands, right? No hole, okay, go up here, no hole. Heck, they, in that picture, they actually don't even show the cutout for the, uh, for the aerial mast very well, so. Okay, well, what's up with that? So, let's go over here. The next time we see the fuselage is in step 12. Okay, you can see the cutout for the aerial mast and behind it, there is a hole, what appears to be maybe a hole drilled or, or molded halfway through the fuselage wall. Okay, over here, definitely no hole. All right, so usually with stuff like that, Tamiya tells you that you got to drill it out. Okay, like they do here on the wings for those little scoops. They tell you, go drill those. All right, well, next time we see the fuselage in that area is in step 19, and there's clearly a hole there, but yeah, I, unless I'm just blind, and that's entirely possible, I don't see any place where they told you to drill a 1.2 millimeter hole uh, once the uh, two halves of the of the fuselage are together. Uh, and there's no other reference to that thing until again, you get over here to step 28 and they tell you to just install it in the magically appearing hole. So, all right, again, I honestly have never been 100% convinced that that light is on all Spitfires. And maybe that's the reason why it's an optional hole, and or maybe it's not, e I don't know. But if any of you guys do know, please let me know in the comments. At this point, I've decided, obviously, to go ahead and install that little thing and made the hole for it. Okay, now, next thing is to talk about the uh, windscreen and the canopy and the masking all right, so as you can see here, I've done a little bit of said masking, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about how I got there, all right? Uh, because uh, what I have intended to do from the beginning with this is jump into the process of scanning the little Tamiya mask sheet and cutting up my own masks on my uh, Silhouette Portrait 2. Uh, you know, 
uh, the options are cut these by hand, since for some silly reason Tamiya doesn't do it for you, or spend 10 or 12 bucks on a set of pre-cut masks. And I thought, well, you know, I, I paid 135 bucks for the, for the, for the cutting machine, uh, and I have the technology, so let's do that. So uh, I'm now going to go through the process on screen of showing you how to get from here to here. Okay, so this is my sheet of, of uh, masks here that I've been working off of, and you can see this is quite a mess. Uh, as I said, um, I'm not real good at figuring out exactly where to place the artwork vertically to get it to land in exactly the right spot, uh, and you can see that uh, here. Um, but let me explain what else is going on here besides all of that uh, obvious silliness. Why do I have this uh, tape on here. Okay, so this is Aura Mask 810, which is, I think, kind of, you know, agreed uh, on out there as being the best masking film. Uh, it's what a lot of the mask makers like Makatar and Montex are using, and it's really good stuff. For things like Insignia, uh, and markings that are going to go on relatively flat surfaces. Uh, even though the vinyl is stretchy, at least in theory, it has proven not to work well on uh, compound surfaces. And, that, and, and you've definitely got that here with uh, things like the windscreen and the uh, canopy bubble. But I was going to go ahead and cut them out anyway and, and give it a whirl. Um, and... I very quickly found that I was right, and these little mask things here uh, for the windscreen just didn't want to stick. Um, there's this uh, little part uh, right here where that little half moon shaped thing is, and they just didn't want to stay put. Even the, even the ones that I cut out of, of tape don't stay really well. So what did I do? I've got this. Uh, this is the Tamiya 40 millimeter tape, which is actually uh, Kimoi. Uh, they're the same. They're the parent company of MT, the people who invented washi tape. This is in fact washi tape. It's a little different than the other Tamiya tapes. It's a little stickier, and uh, anyway, it works great for this purpose because it's so so wide. And what I found that I could do is just stick it directly on the. Uh, the, the sheet of Aura Mask, uh, I tried sticking it where I had already peeled some off, thinking that I should do it that way because it, you know, might be too hard to remove if I put it on the other part. Uh, and that, in fact, was not true. It, it peels off of there just fine. And so the cutter will cut through uh, both, both pieces of material, cuts through the tape. Uh, and the uh, aura mask underneath it. So, hey, you, you have instantly doubled again the number of masks that you've got. But obviously you have to sort of carefully predict where you put it or you get some silliness like that where one cut job crosses over another. So anyway, uh, that is uh, how this thing got in the condition that it's in. Um, and now I'm going to show you how I actually generated the uh, cut paths to do all this. Okay, this is the Silhouette Studio software app. And you get this when you buy, uh, I guess, any one of the Silhouette machines. Mine is the Portrait 2. I think they're up to the Portrait 3 now. Um, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's an okay uh, software app. I mean, you have to have it to run the machine. Its basic function is to allow you to uh, place your artwork and then send it to the cutter. Now, the key thing here with what I'm going to show you guys um, is that the, uh, the normal format that this thing wants when you import files into it is uh, a DXF uh, file. That's its favorite thing. And when you do that, you have really nice, clean artwork, like this one from a previous project I did. The problem is that you've got to have some other, <coughs> excuse me, you've got to have some other piece of software 
to create artwork that you can then convert to DXF format. And that, you know, there are a number of different ways to do that. You can use Adobe Illustrator if you have it. Um, if you use a CAD package, you should be able to export a sketch entity as a DXF uh, and, get, and, and get to this point that way. And that's really the best thing. But number one, a lot of folks don't have those other software applications to create DXF artwork. And uh, if you are working from a scan, like I am in this case, because I've scanned the, the uh, Tamiya uh, uh, masking uh, materials that come in the kit, then you're starting from a different point. So what, what we have to do is approach this from a different direction. And that is getting the scan into the Silhouette Studio. Now, uh, one of the ways that you can do that, that uh, works pretty good is to uh, bring it in as a PDF. But in order to do that, you have to have the Silhouette Studio Designer Edition. The Designer Edition upgrade is something that you get from Silhouette themselves. It normally costs $49.95, uh, and uh, I got it. Uh, it's been on sale lately for half that and that was you know that was an easy decision to make and what that allows you to do is import a PDF so that's a pretty direct path but you obviously have to have a way to create a PDF from a scan so again you need a, you know an additional piece of software to go from JPEG to PDF and I'm gonna show you uh, how to do that uh, you could also bring your scanned JPEG into something like Adobe Illustrator and use it uh, as, as the basis for creating your DXF. You could also insert it into something like Fusion 360 as a canvas and use it as a basis to create a sketch that you then turn into uh, uh, a DXF. Point being is there's, mu there, there's multiple different ways to do this and they all require a series of steps. So what I'm going to show you here is just one pathway. And I don't claim to be an expert on any of the stuff involving uh, uh, Silhouette Studio. I basically know enough to be dangerous. So, you know, take that into account as I show you how to get to this point right here. All right, so the first thing is going to be to bring the scanned JPEG into Photoshop. And I think a lot more people probably have access to Photoshop and the, and the skills to do this than they do to use Illustrator. So I feel like this is a little bit more straightforward maybe. So first thing I like to do is crop the thing and get rid of all the excess you know, stuff that you don't want to have to deal with. So I'd crop it. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I want to increase the contrast. I want to uh, make it so that all of the artwork stands out as much as possible uh, and that the background is pure white. So what I do then is I add a curves layer. And curves layer, uh, curves are a pretty normal thing in Photoshop. Um, and it, basically what it, this curve allows you to do is adjust the black and the white values. And so you can see that's what I've done here. Um, it's basically just a process of moving the endpoints of the curve around so that you tell it, okay, for example, you can do that by grabbing this eyedropper thing here and then you click on what you want to be the white point, which is the lightest thing on there, and you then basically just turn all that where it's bright white. Do the same thing with the black point and get to where you've got nothing but uh, all of this uh, artwork in as much uh, you know hard black as possible. Because the, what you want is when you export this, you want all these lines to be continuous. And you can see that that's already a little bit of a problem on some of these because even though I scanned it in at, at uh, 
1200 DPI, you know, none of these lines are perfect. Uh, some of them are just not as dark as, as others, you know, and I can continue to tweak the curves to help myself in that respect, but it's never going to be as perfect as it is on the, uh, you know, on the original. And I still need to get rid of uh, the, uh, you know, these bits and pieces of text and things here. And the, and the simple way to do that is to just, uh, I just grab the brush tool, which you can also access by just hitting the B key. Oh, and I have to be working on the background layer to do that. So I hit the B key, make the brush large enough, select the background color, and then just go in there and start removing all of this garbage that I don't need. All right. And by going through that process of cleaning up the file, you will end up with something that is basically nothing more than the uh, outlines of the, uh, of the masks. And you can also take the opportunity to get rid of any of the masks that you're not going to need. Like, for example, I already know from looking through the instructions that I will not be using uh, this thing here. This is only for the B version of the kit, so I could get rid of that completely. I can get rid of all of this right here because that's the same thing. There's a separate uh, windscreen for the B version that I don't need. Uh, I also will only be using one of these two for the rear portion of the canopy, but I can't remember which one it is, so I'm uh, not going to get rid of those yet. But at this point, the thing to do is to do a file and export uh, or a save as. Uh, save as is just fine. Uh, go down here and select uh, Photoshop PDF. And uh, I'm going to call this masks too, so I don't overwrite the file I've already got. All right. But at any rate, you go through all this process uh, and you don't, you know, you don't have to worry really about any of these uh, check boxes. You just save it and you are good to go. Now, we jump back over to Silhouette Studio. And the thing that you're going to want to do is go to File uh, and uh, Open. And you will select the PDF that you just made, Spit Canopy Masks 2. All right. And it's going to ask you to select whether you want to import as a vector or import as an image. Now, I watched some YouTube tutorials, and they said that importing it as a vector would mean that it already has the uh, cut lines. Um, that did not prove to be true, and you can see that pretty quickly when you go over here to send, because that's the place where the cut lines would show up. You can see that here. If I had cut lines, they would all appear in red. And you can see that, that there just are not any. So I'm not really sure what's up with that. Again, I'm not an expert on this, on this app. Um, so it may just be that I'm doing something wrong. But uh, that's OK. Um, what I'm going to do is just show you very quickly how to get to the point where you have cut lines. All right, so the first thing you need to do, um, I, I'm not real good at figuring out exactly where on the, the uh, uh, sheet that I have to place the, the uh, artwork to get it exactly in that spot. Uh, but it doesn't really matter as long as you're in about the right place. But you can move it all over, and, you know, whatever you, you need to do. So if you move it down there, though, you have to increase the size of this red box. And the easy way to do that is to uh, select on the media size thing here 
and just put in letter. That way the red box covers the whole stinking uh, cutting mat there. So now once you've got that done, what you need to do is zoom in uh, on the first piece of the thing that you want to work with. And we'll just pick a, a simple one here. Uh, well, let me show you first of all. There's there's a there's a a uh, a utility in here that will let you uh, scan all of this, uh, and it's pretty tempting to use that. Or sorry, I shouldn't have said scan. I should have said trace. And it's pretty tempting to want to use that. This icon over here, this little butterfly looking thing, is the trace utility. Okay, and you can select the trace utility. And you can go here and you can grab all of this and you can see that it all turns yellow. And you can tinker with these uh, settings here. I found that like 70 to 80 worked pretty good. You need a continuous yellow outline for this to even begin to work. So once you've got that, all right, you, you know, I, I tinkered with all these and didn't really help a whole lot. But the important thing is trace outer edge is what you want okay now if we zoom in here you'll be able to see that I have a trace around the whole thing and you can see what happens when you don't have that continuous outline you know it gets goofy and you get this double sort of thing and that is a cut path alright and when you look at one of these up really close, you can see that it's just basically approximating what it thinks the path needs to be based on this jaggedy black line. And I ran one of these and cut it out and tested the fit. And I'll show you the result from that uh, when I go back to, back to my workbench. But let me just tell you that it just really did not work very well. And so I ended up going back to what I'm about to show you, which is how you do this manually. So let's let's back up and get rid of all of that stuff. Just do the, I'm just undoing back to this. All right, so we're back in the uh, design uh, area. And what I'm gonna do is zoom in real tight, the tighter the better on uh, the piece of the mask that I want to work with. And I'm going to show you how you manually create the cut line. Okay, go over here. This little bow tie looking thing is in the line tools is create or draw a polygon. And that's what you want. Even though this shape has a round uh, top on the or on it don't think that you want to use the curve thing it just it's hard to use and and what you what you're going to end up working with here is a series of straight line segments and that's going to be good enough all right it's certainly going to be as good as you would get cutting this thing out manually with scissors or with a knife so once you've selected the polygon draw tool you go down here and what I figured out is that the best thing to do is work in the middle of the scan outline. Okay, so I'm gonna start right here. You can hit the shift key and it'll draw a perfectly horizontal line or a perfectly vertical line if that's what you need. But I, obviously right here I don't. So I've let go of the shift key. I'm gonna go up here to about where I think it's tangent. And then I'm gonna just start making these line segments uh, and working my way around it and just you know try to try to be as precise as, as you can and as symmetrical as you can because even though this thing is is obviously way tinier in real life than it is uh, on your computer screen uh, I learned the hard way that you should not allow that to make you think that you can be sloppy because it will show up. This is, and you'll see what I mean. 
All right, so once you've done all of the, those lines and you're ready to close out, just click on the uh, first uh, dot where you started your, your, uh, your outline and it'll close off the uh, segment. All right, now you can see that the outline is a little bit rough. Okay, let me zoom in just a little bit more. All right, okay, you can see that the outline is just a little bit rough. Um, if you feel like you need to tweak on that, and I could, I, I could have avoided that by just being a little less lazy and making more line segments. But if you feel like you need to tweak some points, okay, this is the edit point tool. All right, and you can see once I click that, that all of these points now become active and you can grab them and you can move them around and uh, use that to massage the shape and smooth it out a little bit, okay? So once you're done with that, you've got a cut line. And now if we go back over here to send, you can see that I have in fact got this red cut line and that's the path that the blade is going to follow. And look, this is a sort of a tedious exercise and it takes a little bit of time obviously to do it, uh, but this is the same process that you would be going through if you were using something like Illustrator uh, to trace the outline or doing it in a CAD package. It's the same thing. You're still essentially going to uh, attempt to uh, duplicate the line that was on the original artwork with your own path. And obviously, you know, it's an approximation, but like I said, it's not any worse than what you would get if you were cutting this by hand. Uh, and honestly, for me anyway, it probably takes about the same amount of time to do all this. And when you think about what it takes to cut out like these little notches here and get those correct, Again, you know, if you're a magician with an X-Acto knife, then, then, then go for it. This is better. But regardless of how good you are at doing it uh, by hand, you don't get the number one magic benefit of, of doing it in with, with, with the silhouette, which is the ability to have multiple copies, okay? Because I can take and select all of these right here and I can go up here to edit copy paste and now I have a whole I have just now doubled my number of masks and I can now print as many as I want to which as you'll see uh, when I go back to the bench is a good thing because basically you've got unlimited ability to screw it up and, and do it over again. Uh, and if you obviously uh, do the same kit over again at a later date, all you have to do is come back in here, open your uh, masks file that you've saved, and boom, you're instantly done. So uh, it's, it's a pretty good system. And now I'll show you the process of actually uh, loading and cutting the uh, material and then we'll look and see how they fit on the actual kit. Okay so if you haven't seen one of these little machines this is what the silhouette portrait looks like. It's nice and small and uh, I just keep it stowed until I need it and one thing I've been stoked about is how easy it is to use and I'm gonna try and video this with my iPhone uh, while feeding the, the masking material in here. It's kind of a one-armed wallpaper hanger operation, but all you do is line it up there on the edge, and then those two arrow buttons, you push the top one, and the material feeds in, and the cutter sets, and then as soon as, whoops, you put your thumb over the, uh, camera lens of course hopefully I won't drop this as soon as you set that up and you go to the send module you hit the send button and it starts and hopefully I've done a good job of guesstimating where that's gonna land on uh, the masking sheet we'll see here in just a second once it adjusts the cutter depth, 
and it just goes to it. And you can see it gets busy cutting that, cutting that material. And uh, I wasn't too, too far off. Uh, but anyway, that's the process. That's what happens. And obviously I've burned up an entire sheet of masking material for this very tiny little Spitfire uh, masking job, but that's okay because this was kind of a learning experience and I don't mind sacrificing a sheet of material for that. Okay, so just a little bit more commentary about the masks that I just showed you how to create. I wanted to see, you know, just kind of how the uh, the ones from the kit uh, work, and so I cut out one of them, and I put it on the piece there of the uh, armored uh, windscreen that does not get used, and you can see that I cut on the outside of the line, and it may be hard to tell from, from the camera shot, but it's a little large, and that's also part of the reason why when I went in there and drew the cut lines for the new ones that I used the middle of the black line just to make sure that they were you know slightly uh, undersized or right sized I guess anyway uh, you can't see it but there's a, a piece of the uh, aura mask on the inside of that one there on the left which is the one you actually use uh, I ended up uh, with a uh, a tape one on the uh, other side and I can see now looking at it again that I'm I'm gonna end up peeling it off and, and redoing it because it's a little bit uh, crooked on the bottom you can see that um, and uh, that's on me because I actually trimmed the bottom of that one off because it ended up being a little too large in the vertical direction there and I've been through like half a dozen of them trying to get it right so what's one more right no big deal um, you can see uh, um, that uh, the fit on the uh, ones for the windscreen uh, look pretty good pretty pretty pleased with those uh, and here later on I will go ahead and do the ones for the canopy now as I've said, I'm doing my canopy closed, so I wanted to go ahead and take it off the sprue and check the fit, uh, and it fits wonderfully. Um, the uh, windscreen, on the other hand, uh, I've discovered a little bit of an issue here, I'm sure caused by, by me, all right? And that is that uh, it, does not want to go all the way down. If It looks like it does on the side there, but it's not all the way in at the front. And then the other side, definitely not, not all the way, uh, not all the way down. And the reason is uh, because it's bumping into the top of the gun sight. Okay, good news, I think I have solved the problem more easily than expected. Because now, if you look, it is pretty much sitting uh, flush all the way around uh, the whole thing. And I think that the issue was not so much that it was hitting on the front of the gun sight, but the gun sight mount. Uh, you can see right here, I think it was just hitting right here on these two ridges. And so what I did was just very carefully use this uh, half round file and came along here and just put a little bit of a chamfer on the inside lip of the windscreen there uh, so that it'll it'll relieve that a little bit and I think that's solved the problem um, 
but here's this this brings up a really important point this is why in general i don't ever believe in waiting until after paint to install uh aircraft glass uh, especially windscreens because you know this is a pretty easy fit issue to solve uh, but let's say it had been much worse and there had been an unsightly gap around that windscreen uh, edge you know dealing with that after paint pff, that's a huge penalty um, and you're just not going to be able to do it nearly as effectively as you can before paint so almost always i recommend putting these things in before paint and doing this kind of diagnosis if necessary now i have a little bit of a dilemma though because i'm going to be doing this thing canopy closed and uh, another lesson that i've learned the hard way is to not completely seal a closed canopy up before paint <laughs> Because almost inevitably, and I've seen other guys uh, with this issue as well, that by the time you get done with all the sanding and the priming and the painting, and you peel your masks off a few weeks later, you're going to find some little piece of flerm has worked its way inside your cockpit that you thought was closed and is sitting right there on the inside of your canopy where everybody can see it. And in this case, that's going to happen because I have the uh, not only this part open, but I'm not going to have this little hole sealed up. And there's the tailwheel hole, and I guarantee you that garbage is going to find its way in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the windscreen all prepped and assembled on there the way that it's supposed to be. And it's a little bit of a, of a trick because they want you to mask and paint the inside of this bulletproof part before you add it to the windscreen itself. Um, and you can see that you know the mask covers over all that, so you, you, you have to do that. And that's going to be a little bit of a trick. So I may end up adding the bulletproof part after all the painting is done. I haven't quite decided yet, but at a minimum, the windscreen itself is going on there here in just a few minutes permanently. But I'm not going to permanently attach the canopy. Now that I'm confident it will fit perfectly and there won't be any issues to deal with after paint, what I'm going to do is paint it separately. And if it fits okay, I'm gonna use the open canopy parts as the mask for the cockpit while I do my painting. Okay, so finally, it is time to prime. And this little thing is ready to go to the paint shop. As you can see, I have installed the windscreen and uh, just some quick uh, notes about that. Um, that's in there with Tamiya Extra Thin. That is my preferred method of attaching all styrene parts, even clear ones. Um, it's, some people will say that uh, extra thin will, will fog clear parts. No, it absolutely won't. Not in the same way that super glue sometimes will. It absolutely will craze it, but that's only if you get it in the wrong place. And that happens. You know, you got to be on your game if you're going to use extra thin. And you can see right there, I was not on my game. I had a little bit of an extra dollop there. And it actually raced right up there to the edge of the tape, which of course terrified me because Extra Thin loves to go underneath tape. But I looked closely on the inside and it appears that I have escaped any issues uh, because I had my tape uh, really firmly burnished down. So, you know, we'll see. Hopefully that's good. Now, what am I wiping this off with? Same thing I've wiped the entire thing down with, which is a little bit of 409, and you can see the kind of mung I got off of there. I am uh, obviously not a believer in uh, washing your sprues, because that's just silly, at least you know most of the time. I mean, if there's actually mold release uh, used, you'll be able to tell, probably. You'll be able to feel it or smell it. And especially on a kit like Tamiya, there's not gonna be any. But you still need to 
wipe all your nasty finger oils and Cheeto dust off of the thing uh, before you commit to a serious coat of paint. That's just the competent thing to do, just like priming itself is. So you need a good uh, cleaner and degreaser that will not mess with any of your surface work that's already there, primer, filler, whatever. And so what I use for that is this stuff that I've talked about before, 409. Now I know most of you guys around the world are not going to be able to get it. It's available in the United States, maybe Canada. It's just a it's just a household cleaner degreaser that's been around since the 60s and it's fantastic stuff. Don't know what to tell you for a substitute. Some people use lighter fluid. Uh, that's pretty good. It, it evaporates quicker than regular mineral spirits, even though they are very close cousins. Okay, now, what's going on here with the canopy? So what I did is I want a masking canopy. And so I just took the two pieces of the open canopy option, and glued them together, and then glued them to the model using uh, masking fluid. And what I use for that is the uh, Mr. Masking Saw R, it's this stuff right here. It's the kind of plasticky, filmy variety, and it makes a great temporary glue. And the nice thing about it is that you can clean it up with water. So if in the process of gluing your, your uh, painting canopy on here, you get a little extra outside the boundaries. You just clean it off with a wet Q-tip. And speaking of which, wouldn't it be awesome if model kit companies included a painting kit? I mean, a painting canopy in the kit for model airplanes. I mean, that'd be awesome. Just a, you know, just a, a blank canopy shape, no molded in detail, but obviously one that would fit on there so that you could do this and not have to worry about how the heck you're going to mask your canopy if you're doing a, an open cockpit version, because uh, we know that's, that's a, that sometimes is a, is a masking tape challenge. That would be pretty cool, I think, and I would gladly pay extra for it. Probably wouldn't even notice, but I certainly would notice not having to figure out how to tape the, the cockpit off. All right, so uh, as to specific primer, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. I'm going off script. I generally do the black basing thing. I like black primer. I like the black basing methodology. And I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to use black. I am going to try out this new stuff that I got, new to me anyway. This is Mr. Surfacer Mahogany. And uh, it's a little thicker. It's the 1000 instead of 1500, but I'll just thin it down a little bit more with Mr. Leveling Thinner. And the reason that I'm doing this is because uh, MRP, which is what I'm gonna be using for all my color coats, is pretty sensitive to whatever is underneath it. You can significantly shift the tone of MRP with whatever you spray as your base coat or your primer. And I find that the MRP dark green and the dark earth that I'm gonna be using on this are pretty dark already and they tend to be a little darker than I want them to be uh, when I spray. And I also kind of like it to have a little bit of a browner tone for early Spitfire green and brown camo. So I think this might be a smart move. I mean, it's there's you know certainly not gonna be a disaster. Um, it'll shift the tone a little bit. I think I'm gonna like it. So this is what I'm gonna use for my primer. And uh, when we come back and see this again here in just a little bit, that'll be the end of this video segment. Uh, and with the next one, I'll move on to actual paint. All right, so priming is all done. And as you can see, I did some weird things. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did do the uh, brown basing, I guess. Uh, I mixed up the... Mr. Surfacer Mahogany 1000, about two to one with Mr. Leveling Thinner. And uh, I tend to always use Mr. Leveling Thinner with, with Mr. Surfacer because it produces a smoother finish that's less likely to be dusty 
in places like uh, this wing root area. So did get a nice smooth finish. Pretty happy with the way my body work looks. I think overall everything is good and even some of those problem areas like I had right here uh, have turned out well. I uh, got that little crack taken care of back there, so that's all good. But you can see that, uh, yes, I have also used some black uh, Mr. Surfster 1500. Um, and I did that because I want to start setting up some tonal variety and some color toning. Um, so, like I was saying, the reason that I chose the brown up here is because I want an overall lighter and browner look to the camo pattern. And I was going to do the entire bottom side with black because uh, I haven't decided which scheme I'm doing. I'm not really sure which color the, you know, what colors the bottom is going to be yet, but black was going to is going to be appropriate no matter what. But then I thought, well, you know what? Spitfires are always filthy right here in this area, so why not start setting up some toning with the brown? And then I was like, well, you know, I am probably going to have a little bit of an exhaust stain going on. I kind of feel like that early Spitfires with the exhausts that stick way out don't have as much fuselage staining as later marks with the, you know, with the tw with the six stacks that sit closer in. But there's probably going to be a little bit, bit of discoloration. And this was uh, a good time to start working on developing that characteristic shape of the stain uh, because basically, you know, I can't screw it up right now. I mean, it's just primer, right? So then I started, you know, of course, tinkering around with all kinds of areas where I thought there might be some... Uh, you know, filth discoloration, and the ailerons were already black because that's a place where I blew out some excess primer before, and I like doing that anyway because a lot of times you'll see things like, you know, elevators and ailerons having a slightly different look to them because they're covered with, with canvas instead of aluminum or whatever, they, you know, or maybe they came from a different paint batch or they've been replaced or whatever. Anyway, it sets up a little bit of nice uh, tonal variation. So, uh, that was also an opportunity to check out this new bottle of Mr. Color, Mr. Rapid Thinner that I got. Now, what is this? If you're not, if you don't know, lacquer thinners are basically uh, designed to evaporate or flash at a certain rate. Um, and that's basically so that depending on your climate, if you're spraying in hot or cold conditions, you kind of can equalize the flash time so that your paint has enough time to, to, to level out. So, for example, on a really hot day, you want a slow thinner that will give you a little bit more time. Uh, and, and on a cold day, you want a, a faster thinner. So, that's what this is, Mr. Color Rapid Thinner. Uh, Mr. Color Leveling Thinner is basically a slow thinner and regular old Mr. Color Lacquer Thinner and pretty much any hardware store lacquer thinner you get is what you'd kind of consider the middle of the range. At least that's the theory. So the idea that people are talking about is that using this stuff lets you do things like airbrushing and exhaust stain or a, or a gunpowder stain with a little less less risk because we all know that when you start to get in there really tight and spray really small that you can quickly get spidering if your paint is is too thin or you know you, I mean it's real easy to, to 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 get into that kind of a problem and the idea is that the Mr. Rapid Thinner just dries so much faster that it basically helps you not have as much spidering. So I thought I'd try that out. And it worked okay. I was, I'm not sure that using it with Mr. Surfacer is necessarily the, the best test case. It got a little bit uh, splattery, as you can see here, um, you know, like right there. And I don't have to care about that, because again, you know, this is all just about sort of setting up some pre-shading. Um, but uh, I think I would have to, I think I'm gonna have to tinker with it a little bit more before I would commit to actually using it on a final exhaust stain uh, or a gunpowder stain. 
But, you know, that's why I do things like this, because, you know, the best time to try stuff out is when there's no penalty. And, you know, look, if you were using it for something like this and you had a little bit of, of that uh, excess overspray, one of these green buffing sticks is a pretty good way to uh, get rid of some of that. You can see pretty quickly that you can uh, knock that off in a hurry if that's what you need to do. You can do it, you know, like if you're freehanding a camo pattern and you got a little bit of, uh, of excess, uh, you know, you can, you can knock some of it off that way. And it's also a nice way to just uh, work on your paint abrasion and degradation. So anyway, that's enough of that. Priming is done. Oh, and you can see, <laughs> yeah, I broke the little shaft, a, a propeller shaft off. That was, uh, yeah, probably a self-inflicted gunshot wound because thinking that I could hold the entire model in a pin vise on that little bitty shaft while I painted it, yeah, that was dumb. <laughs> it lasted clear up until I decided to take the pin vise off and that's when it broke. So I, I don't think I need that shaft anyway because I don't care about making the propeller where it'll spin. So anyway, we'll see. I saved it. I'll glue it back on there if I need it. Anyway, that's it. Priming done. Next episode, time to start paint. Okay, so there you go. I hope you guys found that useful. Um, and as I said, next time we get into this, it'll be time for some actual paint. So hopefully I'll see you then. As always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.